Hello. We are ready to start. Uh, I just uh, welcome all. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Jussi Koitola, head of programs at Frame Contemporary Art Finland, and here is the co-editor of the Rehearsing Hospitality's companion to your book, uh, Yvonne Billmore here with with me too. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so this is a fourth and final uh, event in series of on online events being held between September and October, to October 2020 to celebrate the launch of Rehearsing Hospitality's Companion 2. Uh, the second in a series of readers published by Frame Contemporary Art Finland and Archive Books, which accompanies Frame's five years five-year public program rehearsing hospitalities. This event hosts uh, readings and responses from contributors Denis Ferreira de Silva and Astrid Naimansis. Uh, they will share readings and introductions to their text, followed by conversation alongside with the publication editors myself, myself and Yvonne Billmore. This event is pre-recorded due to time differences. We apologize, apologize. There is no, is not opportunity for audience to direct questions to the speakers. But of course, you can post comments and response into the comment sections on YouTube. The recording is being broadcasted on 8th of October with live captions by artist Iona Roising. Guidelines for safer and more inclusive participation have been shared with all the speakers. Mm -hmm. And here's a bit of an introduction of the Frames public program and, uh, and, uh, and the book, what we are speaking about. Um, Rehearsing Hospitality's companion series accompany, as was said earlier, Frames five years public program. Uh, First year during the program, uh, we focused on questions of how to become more hospitable towards diverse ways of knowledge and different ways of knowing. Uh, this year we have turned into questions of access from multiple approaches, uh, trying to understand of access and barriers to access from physical, social, environmental and epistemological aspects is. Uh, and we, due to the um, situation in, in, uh, in the world because of the, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, we couldn't gather to Helsinki to celebrate the publication, the pro public program. So we were considering this publication also a way to gather different people with different people and different uh, views and different uh, positions on, on the question of access. Uh, so uh, I'm just reading a little bit like an introduction what we have write, written with Yvonne to understand the context and the publication. Uh, now more than ever, we need to be consciously reconsidering diverse forms of hospitalities and ways of being together. With this publication, we wanted to look beyond normative and institutionalized understanding of access. How can arts organizations and institutions treat access not as a general or universal policy, but instead understand access needs coming from plural and decentralized ways of knowing and experience the world. And we have a contributions uh, in the book from Camille Auer, Yvonne Billmore, Annette Decker, Dennis Ferrer de Silva, Amy Hamrae, Hanna Helander, uh, myself, Ali Akbar Mehta, Astrina Neimasis, Marietta Radomska, Marianne Savallampi, Laura Soisalo Soinen, Minna Tarkka and Touko Vahtara. Uh, 
Uh, rehearsing Hospitalities Company 2 is avail available in as an open access PDF and as a hard copy. In addition, we will be releasing ebook and audiobook versions later during this autumn. Information and links how to get your copy are in the event description too. Uh, and I now give the floor to Yvonne to introduce the speakers and the context of today's talks. Thank you, you see a lovely introduction. Uh, and yes, it's a pleasure to be able to introduce uh, today's speakers, Denise Ferreira da Silva and Estrida Namanis, who uh, both have made contributions to the, this publication, Rehearsing Hospitalities Companion 2. Uh, so Denise uh, Ferreira da Silva is Director and Professor at the University of British Columbia Social Justice Institute uh, and a 2019 Wall Scholar. She is the author of Toward a Global Idea of Race and Adiva, sorry, and Adivada, um, <laughs> I'm failing at this title, I'm apologising, and Adibida M. Paga Abel in 2019. Uh, in her text uh, uh, within this uh, publication, if hospitality, then the duty is to repair and to foster, Denise speaks to the importance of acknowledging difference and the disparities existing in who is afforded access to shelter and to hospitality. She explains how we are exposed to and affected by crises are not universal but marked by an inequality by inequality and racial differences. A consequences of centuries of colonial and racial subject subjugation. Uh, sorry, it's quite early here and I'm quite dry, so <laughs> please forgive me. Uh, Denise calls for the reconsideration of the politics and philosophies of access and hospitality. And I quote from her. This time around, the call to hospitality is not about offering shelter, but about making the planet a hospitable place for those whom what modern thinking has prescribed death. And uh, Estrida Namanis, who is also here with us today, is a feminist writer and teacher interested in bodies, water and weather and how they can help us imagine justice, care, responsibility and relation in the time of climate catastrophe. Her most recent book is Bodies of Water, Post-Human Feminist Phen Phenomenology. Uh, okay, and uh, Estrida's essay in the publication is titled, The Body is the Site of Climate Catastrophe. And um, we've written about this uh, essay as being almost read as an epilogue to the publication, uh, being a humbling reminder that these times are not just haunted by COVID-19, but also a myriad of human and more than human crises. Uh, she asks us to, in to access our internal registers our sensory, lived and embodied knowledge as a way to read and know the challenges of the world through our bodies in order to imagine a, and quote, different kind of ethics and politics, end quote. So um, yes, both contributions outline the importance of recognising where multiple and interconnecting crises might meet, but also where difference occurs, uh, particularly in relation to experience. Uh, and there's a, a subtle dialogue that's weaving between the texts. Uh, Estrida directly quotes Denise's work on difference, uh, and Denise 
also speaks to Estrida's work and in particular a quote that we included uh, as a reference in our introduction from Estrida, uh, which is, quote, as bodies of water, we are all in this together, Bray Dottie 2002, but we are not all the same, nor are we all in this in the same way. And that's from Estrita Namanis' Bodies of Water, Post-Human post Feminist Phenomenology in 2017. And um, another interest that we had in bringing you both together for this session is each of your work with water as a planetary body in which to consider and explore complex cultural social, political, colonial, ecological, the list continues, <laughs> uh, relations and relationships. And uh, we too have been very interested in water as a connecting body, uh, something that we've been thinking with within the Rehearsing Hospitalities programme, particularly in 2020. Although uh, probably, um, it's not so visible at this point because we've had many uh, of our program postponed. It will emerge, uh, come to the surface more in spring 2021 during the gathering for rehearsing hospitalities. Um, so yes, this is uh, all from me. And um, I just want to know, we uh, took a little longer in our introduction, so I'll just amend the times. Uh, and it's over to you, Denise. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Yvonne, for the kind introduction. And then thank you, Yvonne and Yusuf, for the invitation to be part of the collection and also to be part of this conversation with Asfrida. And thank you, Asfrida, for saying yes. <laughs> so it's really a pleasure. Um, to be here with you and yeah it is unfortunate that we cannot can all be together with other people uh, for so many reasons um the title of my contribution to rehearsing uh, hospitalities is ungraspable differences if hospitality then the duty is to repair and to foster and i open it with the two quotes um and i'll read both of them and apolo apologizing but I think they need to be read. Uh, the first one is from Antonio Guterres, um, and the second one is from Jacques Derrida. I'll read the one from Guterres. We have seen how the virus does not discriminate, but it impacts, but its impacts do, exposing deep weaknesses in the delivery of public services and structural inequalities that impede access to them. We must make sure they are properly addressed in the response. We see the disproportionate effects on certain communities, the rise of hate speech, the targeting of vulnerable groups, and the risks of heavy-handed security responses undermining the health response. Against the background of rising ethno-nationalism, populism, authoritarianism, and the pushback against human rights in some countries, the crisis can provide a pretext to adopt to adopt repressive measures for purposes unrelated to the pandemic. Well, <laughs> um, the quote from <laughs> Derrida, absolute hospitality requires that I open my home and that I give not only to the foreigner provided with a family name, with a social status of being a foreigner, et cetera, but also to the absolute unknown, anonymous other, and that I give place to them, that I let them come, that I let them arrive and take place in this place I offer them without asking of them either reciprocity, entering into a pact, or even their names. The law of absolute hospitality commands a break with hospitality by right, with the law or justice as rights. And quote from the doctor. When most of us finally paid attention to the to news reports about the coronavirus infection traced to a food market in the Wuhan province in, of China in late 2019, it was probably too late to contain its spread. 
However, as many public health experts and pundits remind us almost every day, it was not and it's not too late to control the spread and mitigate the effects of what came to be called the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Eight months since a Wuhan hospital notified their local public health center of an unknown pneumonia, this now global pandemic has infected, well, now even more, but what, 30, more than 30 million people and killed over a million people across the planet. Back in February, as it became certain that the new coronavirus is, had spread beyond China, public health officials in the US and elsewhere rehearsed a mantra, quote, we are all in it together. We should have a certain catch to it, had it not become obvious when the data regarding infection rates and number of deaths in New York arrived sometime in late March. And it is showing that whilst we are all in it, we are not in it in the same ways. Black, Latinx, and indigenous peoples in the United States have been the hardest hit by COVID-19. Because of the prevalence of underlying health conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, that renders their bodies less able to resist the infection. Because, it, because as it turns out, they are employed in, this, in the named essential services that could not be stopped because they lack the financial cushion, the savings that allows some to take a break from work, and or because their housing conditions do not allow for social distancing and other sanitary measures necessary for containing the spread. It is, we know, too early to tell. Those of us sheltering in place and who are outside of government and big pharma decision-making rooms, we do not have enough information to gain a sense of how the post-COVID-19 global context will set in place. But we know that the global 19 pandemic is indexed, is indeed exposing the racial lining of the global present. On the public health side, as I mentioned before, populations of color, indigenous populations being most, the mostly affected. At the same time, this racial line has also become more evident over the weeks as the number of contaminations and deaths grow in India and in Latin America. And then, okay, I do not separate them, but then on the economic side, we know that cis women of color bear, will bear the blunt of the effects of the effects of the pandemic. They will lose their jobs and they also be mostly hurt by government's decision not to support workers. Uh, either through their direct financial support or through their employers. On the existential political side of things, well, we have the decision making, uh, the decision making regarding uh, public public health measures. But we also have, on the other hand, the resurfacing of fascism, which now includes a combination of white supremacy, mis misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia. A violent discourse that showed its face four years ago during the Brexit vote in the UK and the US president campaign, but which has been further empowered by Donald Trump. In any event, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we can add to this configuration another global event, which is uh, the international protests in support of Black Lives Matter in, that took place in the aftermath of George Floyd killing and Breonna Taylor's killing and the killing of many other unarmed Black persons uh, by uh, US police officers. And these events, which, it, which to me are all global events, they force us to rethink our, our ideas of justice for many reasons. I will mention only two. On the one hand, there is this persistence and accumulation of inequalities, which indicate the failure or the limitations of uh, pro projects, policies of inclusion and affirmative action measures. Um, and then on the other hand, we have both public health and police decisions to kill and let die, which indicate how there is a political element at work in systematic uh, racial subjugation. Actually, both of them do indicate. So I think what I'm, what I'm trying to indicate is that things have to shift now 
at the level of how we think, at the basis of our political and ethical, for the basis of our political and ethical demands must think. We can no longer be satisfied with redeployment of the human, the university, the universal, and the liberal mm -hmm. theories of exclusion and inequality, which propose collective principles, diversity, inclusion, and equality. We need to do more. Uh, ret returning to the global events again, so we can think, for this instance, how black persons are more likely to die from COVID-19 in Brazil and in Canada, how they are more likely to be killed by the police in the United States and the, in the UK, and how they come more likely to come under the threat of the new surge of fascists, as it's happening with uh, to Mamaduba in Portugal right now. And then we think about that other ongoing global e event, global warming, which, as Astrid Neimanis indicates in her paper for the, same, the, the, the collection, and she's going to talk about it now, is not so much an event, but it is it's something that suffuses colors and tones our existence. It is the weather. For this time around, it's not a matter of opening doors, borders to those escaping extraction and drug trafficking related conflicts or the effects of global warming or the daily ravage, ravages caused by global capital. This time around, the call to hospitality is not about offering shelter, but about making the planet a hospitable place for those for whom modern thinking has prescribed death. If hospitality is the concept guiding the needed ethical move, and if, if it must be sustained by the notion of duty, as Jack Derrida seemed to believe, if it alone can obtain the force of necessity, no corrective substantive social justice measure has been sustained without it, if it does so without reference to right or law, then this concept should not refer as it has been designed by Kant to do to a transcendental reign of ideas. The global crisis that will design global existence in the years to come, global warming and the COVID-19 pandemic and others that will come, they require a distinct basis, one that both acknowledges and demands the repair of the effects of old and current deployments of raciality and of colonial strategies of governance both of which are characterized by the organization of total violence. What concerns me is how even when the news feeds started displaying the racial map of this global pandemic, many of us were caught, were not caught by surprise. It's still, as it has been in the cases of the previous global crisis of this century, the global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, the refugee crisis of 2015, most contemporary critical commentary does not consider these global events as such. Let me put it differently. Expectedly, most commentaries on the COVID-19 pandemic indicate the immediate response, uh, as they indicate, the immediate response was to locate the crisis within a context that fits their theoretical frameworks. However, as the infection numbers started to show around early April this year, like any event affecting the human population on this planet, the COVID-19 pandemic is, as I said before, racially mapped. But not so much has been said beyond the acknowledgement of the correlation, as I mentioned before, a correlation between skin color, underlying conditions, housing conditions, income, jobs, which render COVID-19 deadlier to Black and Latinx population in the US, to Black, Asian, minority, ethnic population in the UK, to the majority of Brazilian population, in particular, the dispossessed Black and Indigenous Brazilians in general. What, can, what else can, can be said? The issue not, is not what's said, but the premises. The overall onto epistemological and ethical grounds of this statement, which effectively activate racial difference, even if, when it's not named, to explain away that which is constitutive and not incidental to what is being addressed. This is the case of the UN statement quoted before, the first quote I read. It hits all the right notes. However, it retains implicitly 
the assumption that the figure of the human provides ethical support against recrudescent fascism and originary racial subjugation. My point is, for almost 100 years now, sociologists have demonstrated the correspondence between socioeconomic circumstances and colonial and racial subjugation. However, this correspondence is explained as being due to individual and institutional practices of discrimination and exclusion, which violate the principles of the rule of that, that, that rule the post enlightenment world, those which host the figure of humanity. What has been needed for many decades now are descriptors of the global political architecture that take seriously humanity's constitutive violence. For almost for 500 years, those living elsewhere on the planet have not been strangers to Europe, thanks to commercial capital and its need for commodities, lands, and labor. For almost 200 years, humanity and raciality have cohabited in the post-enlightenment ethical text. To which the letter has added accounts of racial subjugation that explain its mechanisms as an effect of the non-European physical and mental attributes. When doing so, they preempted any consideration of how this set of impossible relation, this relationships inaugurated by conquest, precisely because the letter is predicated by the necess necessary disappearance of the conquered of, and enslaved. I think that wasn't clear. So the relationship is said to be impossible because it's predicated by the necessary disappearance of the conquered and the enslaved. That racialities is an ethical device and the mechanisms of coloniality now operate in support of global capital, there is no doubt. But before healing the ravages caused by global warming and the carnage affected by the new coronavirus pandemic, the notion of hospitality will have to contemplate a global right to shelter in place. No longer a matter of simply welcoming the foreigner, the duty now is one of repairing the effects of coloniality and raciality, as well as of the environmental and human destruction produced by global capitals, extractivist, exploitative, and expropriative mechanisms. It is a matter of dismantling the political, the eth economic, ethical, symbolic, and juridical architecture that facilitate and perpetuate them and to recompose them so as instead of predicating and perpetrating total violence, the political architecture of the global present works towards making the planet a hospitable space, one designed to foster human and more than human existence, whatever it happens to be. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Um, it's, uh, one thing to read it, but also uh, always a wonderful experience to be able to listen to the writer read aloud their own words. So thank you very much for that. Um, so the plan is maybe we just hold, hold questions uh, and come back to them. Uh, and in the meantime, we can just have a short five minute break. So thank you very much.
Okay, um, so I think we're ready to start back. Um, I just want to check that Estrida is there with us. Um, Estrida, your video is off. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, uh, I've already introduced Estrida a little bit, so I will just pass over to her to um, do a reading of her contribution, The Body is the Site of Climate Catastrophe. So thank you also to Estrida for joining us. Thank you so much to Yvonne and Yussi and Denise as well. It's so wonderful to meet you here. I would just like to begin by uh, acknowledging that I'm zooming into you from the unceded lands and waters of the Gadigal people here in what is known as Sydney, Australia, and I acknowledge that these um, lands were indeed never ceded. The body is the site of climate catastrophe. The 2019-2020 Black Summer bushfires in Australia were in many ways unprecedented, even as this is a land grown of flames. Exacerbated by historic drought, the country started burning in June 2019, while the final fires were not extinguished until March 4th, 2020. More than 46 million acres of land were devastated, including 80% of the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area in New South Wales, and 53% of the Gondwana World Heritage Rainforests in Queensland. At least 3,500 homes and buildings were destroyed, and 34 humans died as a direct result of the fire. One to three billion animals were burned, and the smoke circled the globe for a quarter of a year. If climate catastrophe is a phenomenon that we track through hockey stick graphs, sea level rise and PPMs of atmospheric carbon dioxide, it is also written on smoldering coursing through our bodies. Pick up again the long struggle against lofty and privileged abstraction, wrote Adrian Rich, and begin, she writes, with the geography closest in the body. But what does it mean to say that the body is the site of climate catastrophe when we already understand bodies to be excessive of their own containers, extended through deep time and into deep futures, in short, when we are always already more than ourselves? And what does this mean when climate catastrophe is also already colonialism, white body supremacy, heteropatriarchy, ableism, hatred of the poor, and where the trauma of catastrophe is not only individual, but social, intergenerational, and multi-species, and when it is pervasive as the weather. If the body is the site of climate catastrophe, how are we to feel? Part one, bodies are always in excess of themselves. The fact of embodiment lays bare the fallacy of a masculinist, self-sufficient and exceptional human subject. Human bodies are implicated in, dependent on, composed of and constituting worlds. We are already everything, everything already is becoming us. News reports beamed around the world spoke of a whole country set alight. The extent of the bushfires was difficult to fathom no state was missed and the wreckage amounted to an area larger than entire countries. Yet on New Year's Eve, fireworks were still ejaculated from Sydney Harbour Bridge and intoxicated urban humans jostled for the money shot. Less than 100 kilometres away from that crowded quay, others struggled to trace the shape of unbearable loss. This is the wiliness of any geography where a flat map is in fact a striated and cratered territory that like a magician's pockets, harbors ever expanding and incommensurable worlds. We are all here now, but how do we enter each other? 
before, when the fire still fit, felt far away, I accidentally read Dry Spell, a short story in a collection from the 1940s by Australian writer Marjorie Barnard. This strange tale of climate fiction avant la lettre deposits the reader into a dystopian Sydney plagued by encompassing drought. Even the deep feeders, the black butts and the like were dying, she wrote. The narrator stumbles with other Sydney ciders and displaced rural inhabitants, all of them trying to escape the fires in the countryside, all of them trying to reach the ocean. The story ends with a few fat drops of rain. Feel that? Someone standing next to them asks the narrator, but the narrator refuses any meteorological redemption. Quote, nothing would come of it now, the story concludes. We must take up the burden of remaking the world. In January, I walk along the river under the piss yellow sky and think about everything those waters are washing out to sea, carried from somewhere just beyond my field of vision. The mullets, like other fish that feed along the bottom of eutrophic waterways, have learned to utilize atmospheric oxygen, so they leap sometimes two feet out of the water trying to catch a breath. As ash from the fires settled into the waterways, bacteria started to eat the ash-borne carbon. This means eating up the oxygen too. Now, half a year later, when the filter out the smoke masks have become guard against the droplets ones, the yellow sky still hangs in my lungs. Part two we need to talk about our feelings. Embodied knowledge, while often denigrated and disavowed within the modern colonial episteme, confirms that Western scientific validity comprises only one kind of knowing. Manifest through poetics, aesthetics, and otherly, other bodily attunements, sensuous knowledge is open to alternative modes of relation. In confirming the, the body as the site of climate catastrophe, we must simultaneously devise and hone tactics for living that resist categorical imperatives and rational logics. These will not be sufficient guides through our current dilemmas. A sensory, embodied, affective, and imaginative relation to the world opens to a different kind of ethics and politics. Trying to become better read in the field of trauma studies, I learned that, quote, the body keeps the score. Both personal and intergenerational traumas are lodged not only in something we might call mind or psyche, but in the wet fabric of our flesh. I am reminded of Sandor Ferenczi's thalassal hypothesis, which suggests that dreams of water recall not only the trauma of birth as we are expelled from our mother's wombs, but also the phylogenetic catastrophe of the drying up of the seas. Tetrapods were finally forced to adapt themselves to a land existence, above all to renounce gill breathing and provide themselves with organs for the respiration of air. Ferenczi posited this phylogenetic recognition of our descent from aquatic vertebrates as an embodied collective memory across deep time whereby loss, sociality, desire, and grief circulate through our cellular structures, a biological unconscious. When places like Malakuta on the south coast were overtaken by fire, everyone made for the beach. Part three, climate change is all the changes and all the nothing really changes too. While the Black Summer fires may have been unprecedented, they did not arrive unannounced. Quote, Indigenous peoples around the world have warned of colonial mismanagement of land, water, skies, and people, writes Hannah Bronte, a Waka Waka and Yegel artist, in her text that accompanies a photography and video work called Telus Terra from 2020. This series depicts five women some traditional owners, others visiting from lands connected and affected by rising seas, droughts, and volcanic eruptions, 
who are holding children on, beside, and inside their bodies. The women in Bronte's work, like the scorched trees in the forest in which they stand, are wrapped in black. Out of the blackened bark, new branches sprout incandescent green. Quote, how will I water my children while our country is on fire? Bronte asks. As far as I can tell, Tellus and Terra mean the same thing. Country, land, mother, earth. In an interview about another work called Gila, Bronte reminds us, quote, Most women have been sexually assaulted. I don't want to continue to make that all ours to wear. We all carry it around secretly. It feels so cyclic and insane, but it's a fact, a story like anything else, end quote. The ABC reported that during the bushfires, domestic violence rates will spike as they have in former bushfire disasters, one crisis slipping into another. Two words can mean the same thing and neither might be a lie but we still have two words and what are we to do with that? Quote, the capitalist patriarchy that enforces white supremacy is on fire, writes Bronte. The video soundtrack in her artwork, Tell Us Tara, is water, only water. Part four, everything and everywhere is not every same, which is a quote from Tesli. We keep telling the nine-year-old that in Sydney we are safe. She points incredulously to the trees that surround our little rented house on the river. Why those trees but not these? To say that our bodies are already becoming everything, already becoming us, feels too dangerous in its expansiveness. Total subsumption. We selectively siphon up the weather, some bodies storming, others keeling, patterns emerging. As one expression of this, Denise Ferreira da Silva offers us the idea of difference without separability. On this understanding, and I'm quoting Denise here, difference is not a manifestation of an unresolvable estrangement, but the expressions of an elementary entanglement, end quote. Bodies differ because they are constantly finding new ways to manifest a subatomic fundamental constitution. So Ferreira de Silva's is an invitation into, quote, the world as a plenum, an infinite composition in which each existence singularity is contingent upon its becoming one possible extension of all the other existence with which it is entangled beyond space and time. I finally can name some of the trees that line the path along the river. Mangrove, Jacaranda, Casarina, Illawarra flame tree. Hannah Bronte writes, colonizing plants don't know the fire. They weren't born of flames. They don't know the intricate veins that run far below the surface. It would be impossible for them to feel that deep. Slowly and carefully, the native greens settle into the soft terrain, taking up space just like she should." End quote. Many oceans brought me to this place, but that does not mean I was invited. In this surfeit of ecological catastrophes intertwined with personal ones, I whisper into the rain, always still louder than me. Who am I to feel this trauma? Who are you breathing in the ash of one and a half millennia of white body supremacy, of witch hunting and Holocaust, of slavery and colonialism and persistent incandescent survival in the wake? Who are you breathing in all that is wasting and worlding at the bottom of the sea? Who are you not to feel this? This is also what made you, the rain whispers back. Climate catastrophe is like weather, everywhere and always, the life world made sensible. But the metaphor reverses and literalizes itself too because climate catastrophe is also just weather. 
part five, climate catastrophe is a structure of feeling. Bones strong, eyes averted, fascia strained, waters spilled. All the pieces may be pulled apart, splayed, pinned, inspected, but a structure of feeling can only be discerned by looking at the lived experience in its entirety. It is not contained in any part, but seeps through them all. A structure of feeling will saturate the life world in complex ways as mood, attitude, manners, emotions, and so on. Blood rushing, breath shallow, heart broken, heart full. I take pictures of the river every day over the course of the Antipodean summer, trying to be present to its tiniest politics. Danny writes to me in March, or was it April? Have you read Jenny Ophel's book? We discuss the project of writing a novel where climate catastrophe is the unremarked backdrop. Last year, I read the book City of Trees by Australian writer Sophie Cunningham, a collection of essays about extinction and our connection to non-human worlds. The chapters consider what gets lost and what gets saved, when we, what we let go of and what we keep, and trees bear witness to this all. Near the end of the collection, Cunningham picks up a thread she has woven through previous chapters about her two fathers, their deaths, and sets her complicated sadness over these events alongside the story of Rani, an Indian elephant gifted by the King of Siam to the Melbourne Zoo in 1883. When upon reading her draft manuscript, one of Cunningham's friends suggested that the essay is, quote, repressed grief about her father's deaths, Cunningham is horrified. She writes, not because she was wrong, but because I don't want to suggest that the natural death of a parent is in any way akin to the grief that we may soon live in a world where there will be no elephants left in the wild, end quote. Well, I don't understand this part of the book. Cunningham asks us rightly to resist the leveling of all catastrophes. She is also properly wary of the urge to personalize these more expansive deaths because to do so is to also metaphorize them. But I want to know how else are we to feel them if not as the lump in our own throats? Writing about his own father's death amidst a world of extinctions, Australian cli-fi novelist James Bradley suggests that, quote, a lifetime is an ocean and an instant. It does not matter whether something happened a week ago, a year ago, a decade ago, all loss is now. Grief does not stop or disappear. It suffuses us, inhabits us. What is lost remains with us, felt in its unpresence." End quote. Interviewed in the first days of January, a dairy farmer from around Cobargo in southern New South Wales describes, quote, a raging ocean that went through. I think a lot about this slip slide in the farmer's imaginary, blanket of flames thrown across the country becoming ocean. To find poetics in a disaster may not be at all, quote, to give in to the siren song of a resolved narrative as Cunningham feared and resisted. It might be instead to insist on the incommensurable connectedness of things whose holding together we almost cannot bear, a work that only poems and bodies know how to do. Part six, we are all bodies of water. As bodies, we are also always almost gone, flesh to food, bone to earth, water to water. To be a body of water is also to know that we, that I, will ultimately dissolve. Dissolving into other oceans, we are physically but also chemically transforming, while climate catastrophe demands of us a reckoning with so many worldly dissolutions of bodies, species, entire life worlds, it also takes seriously the work of dissolution as a way of reorienting ourselves to these times. What can we stand to relinquish? Of what should we let go? On the evening of the summer solstice in December, we are on Helen's dead mother's porch and we scrawl messages on small pieces of paper, then set them on fire in a large bowl. 
I don't remember what I wrote, but I remember the quiet transgression of lighting a match and burning something, even though the porch was enclosed and the floor was concrete. So this is an argument neither for retention or memory, nor for dissolution or forgetting. It is rather a question about, to quote Denise again, difference without separation. When our bodies no longer remain and all the worlds have been unworlded and then worlded again, there is still the weather. Your body is the whole ocean. My body is the droplet or the spark forming below your tongue. Mm, thank you. Again, yeah, that was really wonderful as with Denise to have the opportunity to listen to you read that and to feel that text on another level. Um, yes, thank you for letting us listen to you read it. Again, we're just going to um, honour our break time and have a quick five minutes uh, and then we'll be back to uh, have a discussion together. So thank you. Okay.
Okay, great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I guess we haven't planned so much how this will go, but I think we can kind of organically have a discussion and I don't think we'll be short of things to speak to each other about. Um, maybe I would, um, just to get the ball rolling, maybe I will start with a question to both of you, which also speaks to why we were interested in having um, this particular reading event with bringing you both together. Um, okay, so, and also to maybe bring it back to uh, our publication and some of the choices that we've been thinking about and um, this kind of editorial approach um, where we've been interesting, interested sorry, in presenting uh, different perspectives, experiences, knowledges, um, and positioning them in relation to each other sometimes, but also uh, in contrast and in contradiction or intention. So mm, dealing with hospitality in a kind of more complex way as well, uh, not just as a ghost, a sort of host guest relations, um, but sometimes thinking about um, where's the potential conflict also in, in these issues. Uh, and so with both of your texts, I'm interested in how global urgencies and issues are treated as both structural and embodied. Uh, and how maybe complexity is brought back to the intimacy of the body. And I think both texts deal with this idea of expansiveness and specificity in different ways. So I wondered if you would each like to speak a little more to this. Um, perhaps, uh, Denise, I could ask you first. Um, yes. Um... Thank you uh, for um, noting and bringing out um, this connection. I think it's um, it's funny because it's a question that I should be able to, I should uh, answer just like immediately because I know exactly why I go for complexity. Um, but then at the same time, it's a it's not an easy question to, to answer because it takes a because it will take a long story. So I, I'll try to find the the middle, um, and I think. I think the middle has to do with um, perhaps the kind of questions that I've been, um, I have been trained, not so much trained, uh, but trained to, to pay attention to. And, um, and from, from the very beginning in my, um, well, since I can see myself as a thinking being, which is, it started early, um, those questions were, necessarily brought to the place where I lived and the conditions under which we lived. So there were questions about the military dictatorship in Brazil, there were then questions, more general questions about the revolution, <laughs> more general questions, um, which then as, you know, as I went to college or whatever, then became also more on the epistemological questions. But they all from the beginning, and that was because I was, uh, I started thinking as an activist in the Catholic Church. Um, so, which was training activists, well, militants, we're not, we didn't call ourselves activists back in the, in the old days. Um, very much facing off with the Brazilian, uh, you know, like dealing and resisting the Brazilian uh, dictatorship. So the questions always came back to uh, why we live in this under these conditions. And if we want to answer that question, uh, it's strange immediately to go out to the big, large structural, of course, more economic and political context. So that's how I've been trained to think. But then, of course, that is, a, that is, a, that is, a, um, how would I say that? I can, that is, a, I like it. <laughs> I like, I like the puzzle. Um, and I think the puzzle is more, the, the, that puzzle is more interesting when you, instead of focusing on, on, on the particular and try to break something small apart, or instead of going for the abstraction and speculating, if you try to find either way, right, then you, 
it takes you, it, it, it complexifies immediately because then you have to look at the correspondences and the connections. And um, yeah, I think that's the com yeah, big answer I can have. The middle answer I can have, <laughs> I can give. <laughs> Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. It's, yeah, I suppose like Denise, I'm a little bit, you know, which, which angle do you start it from? Because in some ways it's your life's work, right? To try to put together the big abstract structural political questions with um, like lived experience, um, yours and those that, that, that you, that which you witness, you know, around you. Um, hmm. I suppose one way I could answer it would be uh, to speak specifically to the theme of this book and, you know, Denise's, uh, uh, you know, epigraph that she read out at the beginning of her talk from Derrida, you know, about, you know, hospitality requires that I open my home. And the refrain that went through Denise's work uh, about, you know, the global right to shelter Although, of course, Denise, I hadn't read your piece when I was composing my own. I think those those questions that you put, you know, what does it mean um, to open your home? What does a global right to shelter in place actually manifest as? I think those were kind of, you know, questions that I was trying to grapple with in my own piece when... Um, if all of the kind of work I've done up until this point around bodies of water and connection and blah, 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 um, means that I understand climate catastrophe as also, um, you know, an embodied phenomenon, then for me, that means like, what does it mean to be hospitable? What does it mean to open my home, my body to climate catastrophe, right? Um, how can I be a home for that? You know, and I can think that abstractly and structurally, but I can also think that at a very lived and personally felt level. And if climate catastrophe is also uh, racial subjugation and ongoing colonialism and white supremacy, then what that is also asking me, my, me to do is to open my home to that, that understanding, right? Which um, I suppose is a way of saying that as a white settler woman, I think that asking the question, how is the body the site of climate catastrophe is an another way of asking the question, what does it mean to offer everybody a global right to shelter in place whose answer demands me reckoning with at a very embodied level, um, the inseparability of, you know, the racialized crisis that we are witnessing, climate catastrophe that we are witnessing, and also, of course, COVID-19 and those continuing things, right? So <laughs> I actually don't think I said anything right now, except that, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to put them in place, right? And I think what I'm trying to also say is when I, when I did that and open, you know, you open your home up, to being a host to those things, what, what I discovered was I had no fucking idea how I feel. Like this really, um, really fraught uh, relationship to um, being in the world, which I'm not saying that like, as I want your sympathy or your pity, it's just something that I have to look at and acknowledge and then start to work that through, right? And so starting with the very particular and personal place um, is a way to work through those really big, complex political questions that we know are connected, but it's really actually then quite difficult to, um, to uh, work through those connections in, 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 in ways that mean something and do something and change something. You know, it's one thing to pause it, it is another thing to start working it through. So opening one's home in a hospitable way to this fraughtness of feeling and really looking that in the eye for me is a way to work through that bigger, that bigger question. I'll stop it there. <laughs> I think that's great both. Uh, I think 
I, I guess I purposely ask this question because I'm very interested in it and I don't think that there's a like an answer either I you know it's not a kind of singular response um, and I don't think the response is necessarily the same today as, as tomorrow uh, because these are things that are tensions that we're trying to maybe work through and it's a process so they're always shifting um, yeah I, I thought this is really important reflections on that so thank you um okay maybe do you each have responses for each other or you see would you like to say something maybe i'll um pass over to uh either denise or astrida and come back to you you see yeah yep yeah, i i have um... Lovely. I have four questions. <laughs> um, I have four questions, but uh, first I want to say that it's um, your piece is so brilliant, so beautiful. Like I, I found it really moving, Asrida. And it touched me. And then it touched me um, because, okay, I knew I knew you're based in, in, in Sydney. And so I knew, I mean, I did, you know, as I, as I read, I said, okay, from the very beginning, you're talking about Australia, but it's interesting because reading the piece recalled how much Australia is based in me because, you know, I have had a relationship with almost 20 years relationship with Australia. So it, you made me miss home in a funny way, but anyway, that's, um, um, but I think was also important because you, it made me consider the different levels of implicancy, right? The different levels in which we welcome, in which we are already open and become open to, uh, yeah, to things that never thought you you would. So Australia, that place which is exactly on the other side of Brazil, is home to me too. But <laughs> um, so my my uh, my first question for you, I think it's. Um, I th well, initially I thought, so this is so obvious, and then I thought maybe it's not so obvious because it's me. And uh, the this, this stories, um, you write, you, you, there is a narrative, and you're telling us something. And then in that narrative, that is something, memories of the fire. But then you have other stories, I mean, the quotes, that you bring them. And um, so... Can you say something more about uh, you know the, the the stories and 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 how we come to feel because the text is about the body and I but it's also making you know, me feel with the story. So can you? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Denise. I didn't know that you had a relationship to Australia. This is a really interesting like uh, geo geospatial embodied sort of conversation here too with you know my previous and forthcoming connection to Canada and having this conversation now and reading that piece now knowing the west coast of North America is a light and is experiencing a similar level of um, fire crisis as we did last summer here um, you know I think one thing anyone can say about 2020 is like time and space are scrambled in ways that um, you know have always been but seem particularly intensely scrambled for some of us now um, yeah okay so the question um, about the stories within the stories um, hmm. I suppose I have a writerly response to it which is that um, to layer or nest those different stories, which are both sort of a philosophical rumination on sort of bodies and trauma and catastrophe and separation and difference, um, but also about, you know, um, what I was reading and artworks that I was paying attention to that informed me at the time, and then also nested with very... Um, like intimate moments of conversations with my daughter or walking along the river that is my home, being both with, you know, having conversations with my closest colleagues, the banality of everyday life, right, that goes on. Um, I think part of that is like this, this thing we try to do as writers when we are asked to produce a text which 
generally in written form is a linear text that has a beginning and an end and is supposed to have some sort of organizational structure. Um, but we, we're trying to tell a story where everything is, is in there at once, right? And that the banal is also the monumental and the local is also the global and the intimate is also the extimate, right? So by telling these stories like boom, like sort of piled upon each other is I suppose to evoke a bit of the vertigo that I feel trying to shift between these scalar registers in parsing this problem. Um, I, 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 did you, can, yeah, yeah, because see, that is an element to my question that I forgot to mention, which is the work of the solution. Because I think you are talking about it now. Um, as you, it, because I felt like the stories were kind of doing all the different, all the different references coming into the, the text or kind of speaking to it. So the work of the solution. <laughs> oh, wow. Can I ask you to uh, say a bit more about that question? I mean, are you suggesting um, that I am offering uh, too neat of a solution? No, no, I don't, I don't think it's a solution because that, because it, because it, it requires so many different layers yeah, okay. for the, to do the work in the writing, mm. you know, to do the work, which is, of, it, yeah, because it is embodied, but then as, it, it, and maybe because as a writer, I think we, we do, we, we do this, right? The feeling has to come in, into the text. So it's embodied in the text and it's doing the work of the solution in the text. Right. Of yeah, any right. possible narrative that would comprehend whatever it is that is climate catastrophes. That's what made me think. So I, I thought I, would, I should ask you. But then yeah, you're, no, as I, you're answering, I hear it. <laughs> no, I think that's right. You know, in the sense that the solution is just the response of this, um, this palimpsestic sort of experience of crisis that is, you know, temporally palimpsestic and spatially, but also at these different embodied registers. And, you know, as we all are in this conversation, both, you know, intellectual people or artists and writers who have a craft, but also deeply implicated people in our own lives and in, you know, those of the people we love and those whom we have never met yet we also care for. So, you know, how to hold on to all of this. I, I struggle, I have to say, um, you know, a lot right now with trying to find a writerly voice. Uh, and it sounds almost cliche, but like in the midst of all of this that is happening, right? Like, why write pretty words, right? Like, it's a, it's a I think, a, an ethical question I hope that many um, scholars and writers are asking themselves, like, what is the, 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 the value of this? And, and I also believe there is a value, um, but I don't think it's self-evident. And I think it's a question we have to keep asking ourselves um, to reaffirm what that is for ourselves, because it's very easy to slip into abstraction. And in my writing lately, which I've noticed is a departure this year from other kinds of writing I've done in the past, um, a, a real deep commitment to holding on to the most difficult question. You know, the thing that is most difficult to write and understand and parse, that's what I then gravitate towards trying to write about. And maybe I can use that as a segue to throw a question back at you, uh, Denise, um, because in my piece, of course, I'm, I'm very much centering uh, an experience of embodiment, a sensory experience, grounding a certain knowledge and in um, an embodied aesthetic poetic register and something that I know you do as well. I'm, I'm thinking of um, the, the beautiful film, uh, Deep, Deep Waters, that I've, I, I hope I got the title of it right, um, that I've watched with, uh, that you've made with Ar Arjuna Neumann. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, so anyways, this kind of embodied poetic aesthetic register like I'm thinking after hearing you read your text again today you know this important moment you keep directing us to Denise about humanity's constitutive violence right and I wonder if you have any thoughts about it's kind of an open-ended question but like how that constitutive violence is and like I agree with you. So then clearly we must also embody that violence in somehow, in some way. 
How does that, um, like, what do we do with that? Like, I guess, l- let me rephrase the question. I think your claim about humanity's constitutive violence means that we cannot easily turn to the body as some sort of savior site from which to think or act in some sort of way that would be free from that constitutive violence. So um, I wonder if you could comment or say something more about that. Like, how does that then affect the poetic, the aesthetic, the um, that mode of thinking and doing? So it's not only that we cannot just go back to the body, but we can't also just think it away, right? Or <laughs> the violence away or, or theorize, theorize, right? Poetize um, the violence away. Um, but I, w- but what's in that? So when I say humanity constitutes a violence, I'm thinking primarily ab- about the ways in which the ethical notion of humanity does not comprehend the others of Europe, right? I mean, that's something that uh, Srivak has said, and uh, you know, others has, have, have have said before. Now, why? Well, I think what I do go further is into tying it to uh, to racial subjugation. And to the ways in which what I call uh, the tools of raciality, the notions of racial and cultural difference, the ways in which they have been, well, through policy, <laughs> no, not only, but decisions, right? Decisions, decisions that have that have mapped social configurations and the global space um, racially to an extent that every time the racial racial difference or cultural difference is brought up as to explain something, humanity no longer rules ethically, right? Yeah. Becomes, you always go back to some kind of state of nature in which violence is what is to take place. So that's what happens in, in the police brutality cases. That's something I saw I have I, I did a piece on the Rwanda massacres and looking at the cases uh, at the International Criminal Court, and even even if I mean they okay, they had all the evidence of crimes that had been committed by officials, but because they had to, to the court had to um, the tribunal actually they had to to make a case for crimes against humanity. In, I, I look at I looked at 25 cases, and in every case, Hutus became less than human. In some, the violence was always extra, was beyond anything that a human being would do, and in different moments. So, whenever humanity and raciality, they kind of emerge as descriptors of the human around the same time, 19th century. And they have been working together in the, you know, constituting the modern ethical text. So there is a violence of humanity, which is that it, it fundamentally, it, it, it captures a, 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 an ethical entity that is fundamentally European, post-enlightenment, et cetera. And in it always working with raciality as a descriptor of the global condition and, the, and, and social conditions that, you know, every in every deployment of it, uh, death is not, you know, it's not far away, um, including the, this um, this pandemic. Um, so that's one, I don't know, now I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> no, would, I mean, that's really, that's so important. And I guess like the follow-up or the sort of um, more clarif- clarifying question then is, like, I think I have read in your work, if I'm not mistaken, when you write about um, Black feminist poetics, poetics specifically, um, would you say then that the sort of the poetic or the aesthetic um, and the embodied is then also in excess then of that idea of humanity, but in a different, in a different way? Yeah, well, it is in, ex- in excess, um, especially, specifically thinking about the poetic because of how it's not so much in it, it is something else because <laughs> i have different I, I read modern philosophy in different ways one of them i read uh, the text with um, aristotle's four causes in mind mm-hmm. and and look at the con- concepts according to you know each of it's like I'm reading. I read philosophy like I read the title sometimes. So looking for correspondences. <laughs> so in law, it's like looking at the last five hundred years, four hundred years, so and so, 
We know that all the other three causes, efficient, final, formal causes, have been activated to you know, define, describe a philosopher for his intervention. Material causes have not ever been. So all the work I do in, in the writing and also in the, in, in the films with elements and in the classical readings with Valentina, we are very much playing with the material causes and asking the question, what if thinking is sourced from matter, but not matter as already captured by form, but matter. Um, so yeah, the poetico is in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, that resonates very strongly. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, maybe, maybe could, I don't know, do I have a question, but somehow these thoughts which have been uh, coming to my mind when, while you've been speaking and reading, and also maybe continuing from this, uh, when Denise also went in to speak about matter, uh, a little bit when uh, if if kind of Dennis claims in the beginning of the or in the text uh, that let me see it here so I get it right if the duty is to repair coloniality and raciality uh, and I'm also thinking about uh, here them as a kind of material conditions or kind of real conditions but then I'm also thinking about them as as what what Astrida, you were speaking in the text as a, a quite lot is is trauma or like a, like a, as a trauma. Uh, so I'm interested uh, maybe this relationship uh, if the if the duty is to repair coloniality and raciality is maybe the duty is to also to is it duty also to repair the trauma and if the trauma is also not only something what this kind of understood as a psychological or individual's conditions, but it's also kind of a material condition uh, of, of world. So maybe would be interesting to if you could elaborate this, this, these questions a little bit. I don't know, was there a question about these thoughts? Me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can start. Yeah, thanks. Okay, um, okay so if I'll take it from the end um, and take trauma only and if only it is a descriptor of the effects of extraction and expropriation, um, then we can think that then the repair, um, repairing would immediately also um, take care of such trauma at the material level. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't go into the psychological because I don't know, I, 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 I don't like, you know, the subject just would take me and <laughs> undermine anything else I have to say. But then, oh, but then the question becomes, um, but then that is a problem, even if we, if we, we, we do that, if, because, it will, um, it might, it will acknowledge the violence, right, in the relationship, the violence that brought about the trauma. But that presentation of the situation might not get to the fundamental ways through which uh, the one who is not traumatized has benefited from that violence. And it may become again a matter of just, okay, so I take care of it now without the, the radical ethical shift that would, would then connect, you know, both of them, right? And then the whole planet, which would the, the without separability, uh, uh, you know, aspect of it. So I, I think I'm saying that trauma, he, he, the material, Focusing on the material, it's not enough. So one thing I have been thinking about, because um, you know, talking about the end of the end of the world as we know it, the colonization, the return of the total value extracted from indigenous lands and and expropriated from enslaved enslaved persons, from enslaved body. Now I think that's a name. That's what justice is supposed to be. Um, 
it's too long, right? <laughs> and basically impossible materially. So, so I've been thinking about it. I don't know. I have. I haven't. I'm, I haven't decided that. But okay. So, so what if instead of coming up with the principles for repair and and, and foster that that long thing I just said or the meaning of justice, the impossible impossible meaning for justice. How would we live in this world? Like if that which has to happen can never happen, what would happen to, I don't know, the image of the human as no knowing everything, self-determined, having, you know, the life world and, you know, being having everything transparent and being able to um, to fix anything. And so what would it do in terms of how we would go about living um, if that were the case? So, so what if, you know, I think connecting to what you asked, you see, I think what happened that then we all share the trauma, right? Of that impossibility, right? And then, Astrida, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just, that's that's so that's so um well like thought provoking right that what if that which has to happen cannot happen right how do we live i, I really want to sit with that but where you went to is is i think also where i want to go to this idea that to think about trauma if that's what we're going to call it and i'm 100 with you i i don't want to delve into the sort of psycho logical psychotherapeutic dimensions of that but i do want to think about um about it uh as you know if trauma is this feeling of things are out of joint they're not the way we think they're supposed to be that time and space somehow don't line up then that seems to me a useful uh heuristic to to think with but not necessarily maybe in, you know, the traumatized ones who now have to have, who have to receive hospitality somehow from, you know, us white people who aren't traumatized, like no, but I'm thinking here of something I heard recently. It was an interview with somebody named Resma Menikam, who is a, who is a, a trauma, a counselor, a therapist, um, but who specifically works um, um, with the inheritance of slavery and with um, uh, in the United States and thinking through, you know, this current moment of Black Lives Matter and that inherited intergenerational trauma. But one thing that he said really, really stuck with me, which was um, something I riff off in, in my piece, this idea like how could white people not think we're traumatized when if we look at our own history of European extraction, colonialism, you know, uh, from, from witch hunts to burnings to the crusades to all like this massively violent history that we have fostered and lived through and you know perpetuated on others how could we emerge from that not traumatized you know that's really fucked up so you know to recognize that as the place that needs to what I'm like you know what what? Like there's no neutral, untraumatized subject. It's rather about how that trauma is distributed and and lived differently. Um, and if you can sort of, in my piece, I'm thinking like, if I can be hospitable to that acknowledgement, you know, if I can sort of open my home to really looking at that in the face, then um, then what what trauma asks us to do or do next or sort of think about or or readjust becomes a very different kind of question, right? It's not about repairing something um, that we are somehow separate from, right? And the we I'm, I'm referring to myself as, you know, a white settler. Um, it's, it's, it's like, 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 it's different. Um, I feel very, very, uh, hesitant you know sort of even thinking through out loud these questions i think they're very dangerous and they they can slip and slide in all sorts of ways that one does not intend um but that said i do think that there is again this this notion that denise offers of difference without separability is something that i i, I think is useful in thinking also through the question of trauma you know um difference yes 
but there's something about the fabric that it weaves that means we're all woven into it and and matter at its fundamental level is also woven into that somehow and and um right now if that moment is that that out of jointness that we that we experience or feel in different ways um, is something that cannot be resolved then that is a very different starting place um you, to you begin the project of ethics and politics again yeah yeah because you touched on something which was my my last question and um and it's funny because i i start the question like and of course and, but <laughs> who knows now and of course <laughs> but now but it is a question okay i'll tell you what i have after and of course and then but i i but you started talking about it which is the question about the colonial space itself um as um uh, thought as as a, as a place of a space of catastrophe like you know here where i you know canada where i was born in brazil the catastrophe has already happened and you begin the you open the piece with that right australia is a land grown of flames which i thought was a beautiful way of life and then it's also very rad when you're flying down in the morning so beautiful um and painful it is it is catastrophic um so so thinking climate change, you know, in the colonial, in, in, in that catastrophe. Um, I don't, so of course I forgot the beginning of my question, but I just want to hear you continue to talk about, you know, the same way you were, because <laughs> it's the body of the settler. It is, it is a catastrophe that it is the settler yeah. colonial space. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, oh, it's such a big question and one that is like not only intellectually difficult, but personally, you know, exceptionally difficult. Um, and I think that's it. It's like the catastrophe is already here. Um, if we want to think about things in terms of hospitality, you know, this land has never invited me, you know, this country, these waters, yet I am here. Um, uh, Can I say something? Because yeah, maybe, please. <laughs> no, no, because I have been living here for five years, and I live in in Muskim. I live in the in the rice We rent from the the mission from the the the, the, the band, the nation, yeah. and um, we. So that is the Muslim forest in front of my house, and then that is five minutes walk, and that is Pacific Spirit Regional Park. And I, we, I try to walk every day, right, in the forest. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's like, you know. And, uh, and then one day, that wasn't long ago, I realized that I know there are sacred, sacred places in the forest. Like, I know there are sacred water poles in Australia. I feel them when I get close to them. And I know they are here. And I have a sense that they are around, but I will never know no matter how long I live in these lands, I'll never know what that where they are exactly and what is that, you know, the kind of rituals. Um, yeah. right? And then and then, of course, uh, many folks, many Muslim folks who live in the city, ki kids who are born outside, grow up outside of the rest, they also will never know. So that's, you know, that's, that's the catastrophe, yeah. isn't it? And, and we, it is. as a resident, I, I hear, here as a resident, uh, a settler resident, it's like, um, yeah, anyway, so that's. No, I think this is really important. And even it's like a way to sort of bring us back to the beginning of our conversation and, and, and probably wrap up soon, is like even this question of hospitality, right? Like, does it already presume we know who is home and who is stranger, like who is guest, who is uh, who is coming, right? Like I know all of us around this screen now in different ways have been thrown around the world by choice and by circumstance. You know, my parents were refugees from Eastern Europe and we arrived to be settlers in a country that we also weren't invited in. And then because of labor migration, here I am, but I won't be for long. Like. I, I think the question of hospitality is so urgent right now because it also asks us to think about what kind of hosts we can be in, in, in a place where like belonging is so fundamentally thrown up in the air for, for many people who are not indigenous to the places that they live, right? So um, how, do, how does um, 
like maybe that's why I'm always turning to my body. I'm like, oh, just Adrian Rich, thank you. Just keep sending me back in. But then by coming, going in, I can also go out, you know, and like you, Denise, I will never know what the Cook's River that I walk along every day was like before Cook came, like, the, like the, even the name of the river, right? Um, but I can still have a relationship of some kind of wonder and beauty with the mullets that are jumping and the casarinas that explode because they know that the climate is in drought. I think there's um, there's no there's no solution and there's no answer, but it's uh, your invitation to us, uh, Yvonne and Yussi, even asking the question about hospitality and belonging, hosts, guests, strangers is one that um, will continue to resonate probably, as Denise says, in this context where there is no, you know, resolving the thing that has to happen cannot happen. So how do we reconceive hospitality, even as a provocation in that sense? Denise, did you have something to say there? No. No. Um, I think the night is uh, finishing. <laughs> yeah, I, I too. Um, and, you know, it's very hard to cut a conversation like this that feels like... Um, so important and uh, really valuable um, for everyone involved. So but thank you very much for participating. And I think, um, you know, you both made it so easy for you, see, and I, we had all these questions, but actually you beautifully wove them all into your discussion uh, and touched on, you know, why hospitality in these times, um, the value of poetics and artistic practice um, and so on, many other things that we we kind of thought to ask you about, but they've just been uh, woven in there so beautifully. So thank you. Um, yeah, so maybe we could just do our roundup, which involves like, um, yeah, you said you want me to do that. I could just continue. Do you have anything you want to say? Just thank you, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, just also <laughs> to thank you on my behalf. And there's some, as Yvonne said, there's a lot of questions which were kind of answered along the way. There's also something which I've been like thinking a lot and we hopefully can uh, continue the conversation in some format, future maybe. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, just as a kind of maybe round up for me, one thing what's kind of, uh, which kind of, the maybe stays haunting me is this question what Astrid I was just saying about or, or concept using like structure structural feeling structure feeling and then on the relationships which comes from the uh, then is your first uh, reference to Antonia and uh, uh, yes uh, on on the question of what is global event or what question of global event and that is something which i somehow wanted to or like st stays in my mind and i'm kind of continuing to think think with think with this uh relationship just wanted to say that but even you can do the uh, sorry uh, you see the the relationship between the event and the structure yeah uh, yeah yeah so, just so quick it's, back to that conversation <laughs> yeah yeah, we we need to you know, go into this later, but just wanted to say that it kind of uh, like um, uh, stays haunting me. Yeah, always. I mean, at least my generation. I'm, I'm a bit too young to claim it, but I can claim that conversation in the in the late seventies and eighties. Okay. The structure and the event. I mean, you know. Mm. But anyway, it's a different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. more. Uh, uh, like longing this uh, wrapping up, but they won't let No, it's all good. We'll just organize another um, yeah. event around that <laughs> discussion. And it would be a pleasure to be able to continue these discussions in some form. Um, the Rehearsing Hospitalities program is a five year product, program, project. Um, and so there, you know, uh, so much of the premise of the program is to build ideas uh, and kind of keep relations and relationships ongoing over time. So 
uh, this would be very nice. Uh, yes, and I just wanted to say that this was the last in the uh, series of publication events for Rehearsing Hospitality's Companion 2. Um, you can watch all, all four of these um, online events on the Frame Contemporary Art Finland YouTube channel. And also in the event description is a little reminder of, um, or uh, it, there's links and information on, on um, where to get copies of the publication, which are available as PDFs and hard copies currently. So once again, thank you for joining us, Denise uh, and Estrita. Um, I want to say a future thank you to Iona Rossen, who will be captioning this event in the near future. Uh, and thank you, of course, to everyone following on the YouTube stream in the future. Uh, and um, last but not least, of course, everybody who's been involved in contributing to and producing this edition of the companion series. It's been a pleasure to work with you all. Uh, and this um, I think this particular event has rounded up very nicely with a very rich and emotive conversation with a lot of thought to continue the programme and the project and the relationships with. So thank you both for your time today. Thank you so much for the invitation and the conversation. <laughs> thank Likewise, you all. thank you. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.